Hello, start. everybody. I think we can. Uh, I think we will start. We have given people the requisite four minutes to uh, to join us after our stated starting time. So, welcome to everybody. We're delighted to be here with you. Uh, my name is Sarah Bernstein. I'm the executive director of the Rossing Center for Education and Dialogue. This uh, webinar is part of a series of monthly webinars we have been doing on uh, interfaith topics, all sorts of different interfaith topics. Some of you will know that the Rossing Center uh, started, was founded by the late Daniel Rossing as the Jerusalem Center for Jewish Christian Relations and with a particular focus on Jewish Christian relations here in the Holy Land. And we felt that it was particularly uh, appropriate to, in this period between Hanukkah and Christmas, uh, to use the time for a Jewish Christian conversation. Uh, and the topic we decided on was on uh, religious leadership in the Holy Land. I will admit that on the whole, the Rossing Center, most of our work is with the grassroots, uh, uh, particularly within the education system within Israel. Uh, but uh, um, occasionally we also work with religious leaders and we are of course particularly uh, 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 grateful and honored to have with us this evening his Beatitude Patriarch Pierre Battista Pizzaballa, uh, who I'm, we're particularly grateful for, uh, for you being with us tonight, because you are essentially still recovering from COVID. Uh, uh, and, and this is sort of your first, first day back. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. And of course, Rabbi Gilad Kariv, uh, the Executive Director of the Israel Movement for Progressive Judaism. Uh, Gilad, lovely to have you with us. Um, I will uh, hand, uh, for those not familiar with this format of webinar and confused as to why you can't see everybody on screen, uh, this Zoom, Zoom format uh, means that the panelists are on screen, screen and everybody else is not on screen but can hopefully hear us and see us. Uh, questions? You are very, very welcome to write questions as we go along in the chat, uh, and we will keep an eye on the questions and, and ask them when we get to that stage in the proceedings. Um, Hannah, I'm delighted to hand it over to you, uh, and thank you everybody very much. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, His Beatitude, uh, Pierre Batista, Isabella, and Rabbi Gilad Kariv. We are honored to have you here, especially in this time of the year between the Feast of Hanukkah that we celebrated last week and the coming Christmas this weekend. And um, we're going to talk about leadership. Um, and before I'm presenting the, the first question, I would like to present our speaker for those who are not familiar with the very distinguished, distinguished guests we have today. Um, so, uh, Patriarch Batista Pizzabella, born in uh, the area of Bergamo in Italy, um, entered the Franciscan Minor Seminary in 1976, did his studies in theology and classical studies in Italy, but uh, came to Jerusalem to study biblical studies um, almost uh, 30 years ago in the Stadium Biblicum Franciscanum in Jerusalem. He taught Biblical Hebrew at the Franciscan Faculty of Biblical and Science, Science and Archaeology in Jerusalem and ordained as a priest and, joined, and um, became part of the custody um, almost a bit more than 20 years ago um, when he was also later on became responsible uh, or the superior of the convent of St. Simon and Anna in Jerusalem, the, uh, as the center of the community of the Hebrew speaking Catholic whom he served as a patriarchal vicar from 2005 to 2008. Um, he was appointed as the Costos of the Holy Land, the head of the Franciscan order, and served in this position from 2004 until 2016. And um, afterward, um, his beatitude was appointed as the apostolic administrator of the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem, and he served in this position for four years. But as you said in your um, 
in the um, in the preaching when after you were elected as patriarch, Jerusalem was calling you to stay. I mean, you cannot you try to leave Jerusalem, but Jerusalem doesn't leave you. So she pulled you back, and in October, um, two months ago, exactly two months ago, you were appointed. Uh, uh, his gratitude, uh, Patriarch Pizzabella was appointed as the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem by Pope Francis, and on 28th of October to. 2020, Pope Francis bestows Patriarch Pizzabella with the pallium, which is a symbol of authority for Metropolitan Archbishop um, and the unity with, with the Pope. So uh, congratulations for, um, for the new appointment and for the challenging leadership you have. With us is all, uh, Rabbi Gilad Karif, who was born in Tel Aviv and was involved with the reform movement since youth. In, uh, in Tel Aviv, um, Rabbi Kariv did his studies in Hebrew University. He studies uh, law and Jewish studies. And he did his master's degree in Jewish studies in Hebrew Union College and um, received a second master in constitutional law from Northwest University, Northwest University in Chicago. He is a certificate, uh, certif certified lawyer. And in 2003, Rabbi Kariv was ordained as a reform rabbi at the HUC, the Hebrew Union College, and also served as the leader of the community of Bet Daniel in Tel Aviv. Between 2003 and 2009, Rabbi Kariv served as the director of the Israel Religious Action Center and headed the reform movement public and legal initiative in Israel on issues of freedom of religion, relation between religion and state, conversion, and many other social cases. Since 2009, Rabbi Kariv is the, the, the executive director of the Israeli Movement for Reform and Progressive Judaism. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I would like to start with the question, what, what is the role of a leader, a religious leader? My impression that in the last year, in the last couple of years, and, and maybe even during this period of uh, pandemic, there's a feeling of, um, weakening of the role of leaders. Uh, there's a lot of, there's lack of trust in political leaders. Um, there's, um, there's the beginning of even of, of religious authorities in many places, you don't see the parishioners. Um, so maybe it raises questions. So what, what are, what is the role of a religious leader in the 21st century or, or 2020? Um, maybe you can talk also about, about uh, in what areas you think religious leaders should intervene, where they should not intervene, personal challenges as religious leaders in these days, personal challenges in this region with these specific communities. Maybe uh, you can talk a little bit about that um, in our first um, in session. So please, your, your attitude, maybe you can start. Also, the role of the leader, first of all, uh, according to the name, leader should, should, be, should be someone who is leading, has to lead, has to guide. Um, someone who has a vision, specific goals, and uh, knows how to achieve them. This is the first point. The second, you are not leader for yourself. You are a leader of a group, of a community. So uh, you have to uh, let the community to, um, uh, identify with this goal, with uh, your vision. And the uh, uh, important role of the leader should be the one of who, who is able to keep the community united. Leader never can be divisive. <clears throat> so to find this balance between the goal you see where you need to go and the other side to be able to listen to your community, not to push too much. You have to find the right uh, balance for this. It's not easy today because today uh, there is a the culture, the, uh, the individuality is emerging. So uh, everyone wants to become a leader for himself. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I think this is, should be the, the role of the leader, first of all. Uh, able to leave also the solitude, the leader, uh, has to learn to be alone sometimes. When you have to take decisions, you have to say yes and no in the community. You cannot ask the community uh, the opinion. Uh, you have to ask the opinion of the community, but you cannot become a slave of the 
public opinion. Sometimes we have to take decisions that are, they are different from what people expect. So um, uh, today is quite, uh, <laughs> quite challenging. This is valid, I think, generally speaking, but also for in the religious, religious uh, activity. The religious leader should be, first of all, a religious believer. People should see in you as leader, someone who believes what he does and what he says. And this cannot be taught, or you have it or you don't have it. Or you believe or you are religious or you are not. For me, uh, for me personally, uh, now, uh, <laughs> I am uh, have a role of different uh, kind of uh, leadership, a role of leadership during the years. Uh, now is uh, almost more more difficult. <laughs> um, uh, I am called to become a leader of uh, Palestinians, Jordanians, Israelis, without being not Palestinian, not Jordanian, not Israeli. Um, so from one side, I don't belong totally to the group. On the other side, I also. I'm not totally foreign. So, and this is challenging from the cultural point of view the, and the identity point of view here in Holy Land, identities are very strong. Um, you are expected to be identified with the group totally, uh, and which is not always good because the leader should be also free from all the group dynamics sometimes. So uh, this is where I am, what I think. So you're, you're talking about these um, challenges that on one hand, you have to be part of them, you have to share the goals, um, you have to be identified with them. On the other hand, you have to keep some solitude and not make a decision by yourself and, um, and to keep a bit apart from them. So this is kind of a tension yeah. between this, these two sides. And the purpose is uh, the good of the group, of the community. We have to, the purpose is not just to impose your idea. Your idea should be uh, critically accepted, critically evaluated, of course. Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Kariv, um, do you also see this tension between solitude and being part of uh, the question of belonging, being part of a community? Um, how do you see the role of a religious leader in the Jewish society? So first of all, uh, good evening uh, to you. Uh, the Patriarch, and uh, in the, with the Hebrew blessing of Baruch of Echolim, uh, we're glad that uh, you are with us. Um, I need to say that sometimes you need an international gathering in order to meet people that uh, live around the corner. And this is the first time I have the uh, uh, honor of uh, uh, meeting the the Patriarch, and uh, I hope it will be our first meeting, but definitely not the uh, uh, last one. We finished our holiday. We succeeded to survive eight days of fried pancakes, uh, um, but uh, we are still before uh, Christmas and New Year, so uh, I'm wishing uh, you and all the Christian listeners of this uh, webinar with Chag Sameach, happy holidays uh, and, Merry, uh, and Merry Christmas. Um, like a Jewish leader, I'll, uh, say, I'll suggest an answer that is basically changing the question. And I will suggest that, uh, especially today, the important question is not what is the role of a religious leader or leader in general, but uh, um, mainly what is the responsibility of a religious leader and leaders in, uh, in general. I think that uh, always in time of, uh, of uh, a crisis, and I need to say that uh, this crisis, uh, the current uh, crisis, the pandemic, has a unique, char char uh, um, unique element. Uh, um, the leaders that are always carrying a burden of responsibility must be aware to the special uh, burden they are uh, carrying uh, in helping people uh, uh, coping with the crisis, finding ways to live with the crisis and to get, uh, and to get over it. 
And I'm uh, uh, sad to say something that I, I'm sure that most of uh, our audience agree with, that we are living in an era of a major uh, leadership crisis, mainly in the political arenas. Uh, here in Israel, definitely we are in a very dramatic political day here in Israel, but we see it in different uh, places around, uh, around the world. But I think that uh, uh, this uh, leadership crisis is not uh, um, being shown only in the political arenas, but in other uh, arenas uh, too, including the religious, uh, the religious community. And my first expectation from religious leaders today is to understand that their uh, uh, strength, their impact, their ability to, to influence is becoming to be a, a more critical because of the uh, uh, because of the crisis. And here, I would like to suggest the uh, following thoughts that follow the the patriarch initial uh, uh, initial uh, uh, remarks. In the Western world, including here in uh, Israel, we are not only dealing with this tendency uh, towards individualism. Something in the political structure of our societies uh, bring more, most of the people to live outside the communal uh, uh, domain. The truth must be said that here in Israel, when it comes to the Jewish uh, uh, community, most of the Israeli Jews, especially those that are not uh, um, uh, uh, orthodox, do not live uh, uh, as part of an organized uh, community. And I strongly believe that one of the things we discovered during this pandemic is that we are not allowed to replace the centrality of the uh, uh, state and the government and the official authorities, but the expectation that everything can be delivered by the state that we don't need those communal structures that are operating between the individual and the state. This is a false, uh, a false thought. And I would like to suggest that, especially today, one of our main responsibilities as uh, religious communal leaders is to maintain uh, our communities, to strengthen them, and to make sure that in spite of uh, the need to strengthen the inner roads of the community, this is a time for our communities also to look outside and also to maintain and to strengthen our uh, outreach work and our desire to support the larger community even in days that we are struggling to maintain our uh, uh, own organized, uh, organized communities. Um, crises like the current one uh, were always an opportunity for faith-based communities. Many of the spiritual revivals in the modern era arrived after major crises. And uh, uh, I strongly believe that this pandemic, aside to the many challenges it presents to us, also presents a real opportunity to recapture the importance of communal life, to recapture the importance of spirituality and uh, a, a faith-based life. And uh, uh, this is one element. The second element, and I will uh, uh, conclude with that, is that we are living in a very uh, confusing era of uh, fake uh, news and lack of ability to distinguish between uh, uh, truth and, uh, uh, and lie. Now, I belong to a progressive religious denomination. By definition, we are a little bit afraid of uh, uh, being dogmatic. And we believe by definition as a liberal religious denomination that the truth 
including the religious truth, um, have uh, many faces. Yet, as religious leaders, we have a real obligation to remind people that in the end, even if we strongly believe in pluralism, there is a line between, between truth and, and, and false. And when so many political leaders are working day and night in order to remove this border and this line, uh, we are carrying a special responsibility to remind people the importance of searching the truth and being committed to, to those moments in life that yes, there is black and white and not everything is in shades of gray. Um, you were talking, Rev. Like, Rev, about opportunities. Do you see, I mean, you can, can you give more examples of how, how you keep, you use the opportunity to keep in touch, you mentioned keep in touch with the, with the other, other world, with the external world, to do something beyond the community, to bring people back to the community. Can you give some more concrete example of, of what, what's happening in your communities during these days? I, I, I will share a, a positive example in a very challenging situation that uh, we don't know how to deal with yet. Okay? Uh, but both of those situations demand something that not always uh, we can easily identify in religious uh, um, establishments, and that's the wisdom of creativity. Uh, we need to understand, and this is an additional uh, responsibility for uh, religious leaders, uh, uh, either they belong to a more traditional denomination or to a more progressive uh, uh, denomination. This is an era of, that demands uh, religious creativity and communal creativity and educational creativity. On the one hand, I can share with you the joyous fact that in our digital efforts, in our online services, we never reached uh, as, ma as many Israelis as we did in the last eight months. Uh, more people attended the iHoliday services of our communities, although none of the services was a face-to-face -face communal gathering but more Israelis attended our high holiday services than ever before. Because first, more, more Israelis felt the need, Israeli Jews, of course, felt the need to be part of something when they were uh, under a lockdown, uh, uh, in a lockdown situation. But as I said, I believe that it's not only this desire to be part of something, it's a growing understanding that uh, we need spiritual experiences in order to, to maintain and to support our be well-being uh, 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 during this uh, pandemic. And this is a very successful example that we were unfortunate to, we, unfortunately we had to use it, but it was a very successful uh, experience because we were creative in the way we offered our services and uh, um, to the non-Jewish uh, uh, viewers and listeners, uh, this issue in our tradition raises many uh, um, legal issues in order to have a public service in, 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 in a Jewish setting, you need to assemble a group of 10 uh, Jews in our denomination, men and women. Uh, uh, can you count 10 people that are uh, sharing a Zoom meeting as a minyan, as a holy group, in order to have a public service or not? It demands creativity and open. to open your mind in regard to religious uh, uh, practices. At the same time, I need to say that one of the challenges that we didn't uh, uh, yet uh, met in a successful uh, way is the way we support Israeli families in their uh, mourning uh, processes. The Jewish custom of uh, gathering your uh, family and your neighbors and your friends, including people you didn't see for 20 years, uh, 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 in this process of a shiva, after a funeral for seven days, 
people are gathered in order to support uh, uh, the mourning family. This is a very strong social structure in Israel. Also among the non-religious Israelis. Uh, suddenly thousands of Israeli families had to mourn without this uh, influential social tool of support. None of the Jewish denominations in Israel, I believe till now, succeeded to offer a good alternative to this uh, uh, practice that again is one of the most popular and respected religious practices even among the most extreme secular uh, uh, Israelis. Again, a need to be creative, to try things, to dare, and uh, we have a lot to do in that, uh, in that regard. Um, maybe your beatitude, if you can relate to that. Um, well, so what happened in your community? Do you also find this time of pandemic uh, challenging or time of opportunity? Um, how did it affect the fact that the houses of prayer were closed and all the services were done through the, the, the social media, through Zoom? Um, do people more attend mass as they do in the, in the Jewish side or they less attend uh, the services during the pandemic? Well, I have to say that it is the first time we are facing such a situation. We, as you know, we went through intifadas, through wars, through a lot of crises, but churches were always open. The religious activities were always ongoing. And um, this is the first time we are in a situation where we cannot have uh, the normal celebrations as we are used to, used to have. Of course, uh, we also, like everyone else, we, use, uh, we learned how to use the Zoom and the different media and so on. Uh, with a, a kind of success, of course, a lot of uh, people attended, but this is this doesn't create community. At least for us, the celebration should be uh, a gathering, should be a physical gathering. Uh, for us, the main celebration, the Eucharist, is that we share the the body and blood, the the. the bread and wine. So we cannot do this uh, online. And then, uh, so for us, uh, this is a good. We couldn't celebrate Easter. We are not celebrating properly Christmas. And this is a wound in the conscience of uh, community, of awareness of the community. And uh, what I feel, what uh, people write and say and call when you visit is um, they scream, they want despite all the restriction to go to church. And uh, my, our difficulty is to stop them, not to let uh, people go because they need, people need, especially in this period, uh, health is a primary uh, value, of course. We need health out of discussion. But life is not only based on health. Life is also relations. Life is uh, spiritual life, is uh, uh, art, music, to be together, to enjoy to share, and uh, without this, we cannot have uh, a real community life. So uh, now the, um, the technology is helping, but cannot replace. And do you see this time as a time of opportunity? Do you, do you, did you find, I mean, the communities found many opportunities to, to do something that you couldn't do before, something that can yes, strengthen relations or? What is positive is that since we cannot go to the church, we ask people to pray in family, mm -hmm. which is, uh, is very important and uh, is a use that we lost, unfortunately. We go to the, the, we pray in the church, in the house, we do other things. And so since they cannot, we, try, we insisted, and this entering little by little, not just among the elderly, but also among the youth how to pray in the house and family, uh, to create the, I mean, the, to perceive, to feel a little uh, the Christian prayer. So it's actually, it was an opportunity, it is an opportunity to strengthen the spiritual life within the family and it's becoming more a family experience and not just individual experience in the church. 
with nothing else. Only in family we can remain. Uh, we cannot have uh, gatherings, we cannot have everything. No activities, nothing. And the parish priests, do they manage to keep in touch with the community to... Uh, uh, there are parish priests and uh, parish priests. There, there is everything like everywhere, I suppose. Uh, uh, generally speaking, I'm quite happy of the behavior of the parish priests. They uh, find a lot of uh, uh, fantasy, new ideas, how to, <laughs> how to reach people in a proper way, in the more proper possible way. Uh, and of course, not uh, always successfully, but uh, in a, at least they feel that the priest, their leader is close to them. Mm -hmm. They managed to maintain the relation with the leadership, although they couldn't meet with the, with the community. Um, going back to the time, this time of the year that we're now celebrating the different holidays, and going back to the question of uh, the, the role of a leader, because I think um, you have different models of leaders in the stories of the, of the different holidays. And um, I would like to, to ask you, well, Maybe start with, with Hanukkah. Um, what can we learn from the leadership that we see in Hanukkah, in the Feast of Hanukkah, the, the Maccabees, the Hasmonite family? Um, what kind of leadership is that? Is it a positive leadership? Is it a problematic leadership? Um, maybe Rabbi Kariv will start with you, but of course, uh, you'll, be it, I'll be happy if you will um, also talk about the maybe Christian perspective of how do you see the story of the Maccabees, but Rabbi Kariv. So I, I will suggest two uh, perspectives about uh, about Hanukkah, and I I, I believe uh, they are relevant also to uh, Christmas. Although I'm not an expert of the expert here in this panel for this uh, uh, lightful uh, lightful uh, holiday. And the first perspective that I want to suggest, which is maybe relevant to, to Hanukkah and less to, um, to Christmas, is that in a very uh, surprising way, the Jewish uh, tradition has um, complicated attitudes, attitude towards the main heroes of uh, Hanukkah. It is clear that the Zionist, Israeli, Hebrew, modern culture presented the story of the Maccabees as an example to the revival of national life. But the truth must be said, the only reason we have the full story of the Maccabees is because their story was preserved in the Greek language by the church. So the Maccabees, <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. The Maccabees that are a symbol to the desire to maintain the pure Jewish and Hebrew culture, their story was preserved by the uh, uh, Greek Christian tradition or the Hellenistic then Christian tradition and not by the Mishnah and the, uh, and the Talmud. And the lesson I would like to take from that is that we need to be very careful in turning our uh, heroes and leaders to be saints. Now I'm saying it carefully because uh, here I fully of course respect the uh, Catholic uh, um, uh, theology that uh, definitely includes uh, uh, this uh, element, but I want to say it's not I'm not criticizing the theological practice. I'm suggesting that one of the main messages of the Old Testament and one of the main messages of the Jewish holidays is that a human being is a human being. And again, uh, there is no debate if the Maccabees were just human. They were just humans. Uh, uh, and in that regard, our Jewish tradition is asking us Please remember that many times leaders do mistakes. Uh, heroes uh, uh, that must be glorified in regard to a specific action or a specific era can become to be a, a less hero and less a, a, a role model 
for your uh, uh, community. And this is one message I do want to take from, uh, from Hanukkah. We need to be very, very careful uh, um, in adopting an attitude that wipe out the, the line between a leader and a saint, a human being and the presence of the, uh, uh, of the divine, because unfortunately, again, we live in an era that too many political leaders are trying to adopt theological concepts or the theological status that places them a, a, a above criticism and above the judgment of the community. And the two communities, the Christian community and the Jewish community and other communities, we need to say, friends, uh, let's leave the saints to the theological uh, arena politicians and the Maccabees were politicians are not saints. And I'm glad to say that in Hanukkah, we are not celebrating the sainthood of the Maccabees. We are celebrating their heroism and their uh, desire for freedom. The second thing I want to say about uh, Hanukkah, is, as I said already, Hanukkah maybe is the leading Jewish holiday that talks about uh, the need to maintain our uh, a unique uh, uh, a religion, tradition, identity in the in a globalized world. Uh, uh, the role of religious leaders to talk about uh, 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 unity through diversity, uh, uh, to stand against the desire that the globalist uh, attitude will take over. A, a human culture in a, its entirely is a very important role. But at the same time, we have also a role to make sure that while we are defending our unique belief and our unique culture, we are not allowing the fundamentalistic uh, uh, powers in our own community to take over. And in that regard, and this is my last comment, has to do with the main mitzvah of Hanukkah. The Talmud is trying to explain the difference between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai in the order we light the candles in the Hanukkah. Beit Hillel is offering to start with one candle and to end the holiday with eight, and Beit Shammai uh, suggested the reverse order. There are many excuses in the Talmud, but uh, apparently, the real explanation is that uh, Bet Shammai wanted to disconnect Hanukkah from its universal character of a light holiday during the darkest day of the year. And Bet Hillel felt that we can maintain the unique Jewish flavor while we also maintain this uh, universalistic concept of growing the light against the uh, uh, darkness. And our role as moderate religious leaders is to make sure that we celebrate uh, uh, the unique flavor of our tradition while we remember that uh, uh, we have the, the same divine uh, uh, father. I think between the lines, I could hear that you're worried about the glorification of the Maccabees as leaders. Uh, maybe because they were ignoring the diversity within the uniqueness and tried to unify everything and not to be pluralistic or not to allow different voices. Um, and that's quite different from the way traditionally Israelis or, or the, Jewish, Israeli tra the Jewish tradition sees them. Mm -hmm. um, while the Book of Maccabees maybe presents complicated situation and give more place to God in the story, we maybe tend to put more emphasis on their um, achievements, I mean, as individuals. Um, maybe you'd be added to do want to relate to the story of the Maccabees and how, how their leadership is perceived in the church. Because uh, it is part of the, maybe I would just mention it, to remind our uh, attendees uh, who, are, who are not familiar with the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, um, the book of Maccabees is part of the canon, it's part of the scriptures. 
Ato, we cannot pardon them. The old the Protestants, they don't have. Yeah, uh, first of all, um, the Maccabees remind me right now, if I may say, some attitudes of some settlers. Uh, even recently, uh, they uh, made an attack in the Gethsemane church. And uh, I see the same uh, dynamics, more or less. Um, uh, there is something we can, I, right now in their methodology, we cannot accept in something which, if, which I find positive. Of course, violence is unacceptable. I agree with what uh, Rabbi Gilad said. Um, um, the, their violence, the attitude is unacceptable today. It's not a methodology we can use anymore. It's not the way we, you uh, can impose your, first of all, you can never impose your opinion, you know, your idea. And anyway, the violence is never a way. And always uh, to avoid the presumption to be more pure. At the end, you find always someone more pure than you. Uh, what I find the positive aspect, if I may say, is that at the end, they didn't compromise with the civil authority on something that was totally against their conscience. They were not ready to sacrifice to uh, idol, uh, pagan idols. So um, uh, this, for me, right now is what I learned also today because the mentality today is changing, especially in the Western countries. And we as Christians are faced with a completely uh, new laws, new uh, attitudes, which we have to respect. We have to respect. We cannot pretend to impose our ideas, but uh, also vice versa. We cannot accept that their ideas should be imposed on our conscience. So to find a balance between what's come from outside and your personal conscience and, and kind of find a middle way. Um, and I'm, I'm moving toward Christmas because we, we're getting closer to the end of our uh, session. And well, the story of the birth of, of Jesus is definitely give a different example for, um, for leadership. The first thing that comes to my mind is to comparing the leadership of Jesus and the leadership of Herod the king who was uh, terrified that something someone would uh, threat his authority and was ready to kill all the babies under two in order to avoid the Messiah. Um, and, um, and the story that uh, you're going to read in church in, in two days would be a story of a, a child, a leader who was born in a, in a manger and who, who was born in a cave and who was uh, visited by, um, by the shepherds and the wise men. What kind of model of leadership uh, do you present um, from the story of the, or do you see in the story of the, of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem? Uh, Herod was not a leader, was a dictator. There's a difference. Because mm -hmm. he used the power for himself, not for the community. The purpose of the power is the power itself. So, uh, and everything can threat uh, his power, who threat, uh, he says they threat the kingdom, but it threats him as person. So it's a completely different attitude. Uh, and and uh, so you have to, Herod is a negative example, of course. Uh, for Jesus, the reality is uh, completely opposite. I mean, um, uh, first of all, um, the fact that he received the wise men, the shepherds, and so on, means that uh, Jesus is part of, the, of his people. He recognized, he has been recognized by, by his people. And um, Jesus, uh, the Jesus activities was an activity that he manifested with auto, uh, authority and not dictatorship. I mean, he was attracting, he was not imposing. And uh, so, and uh, he created unity, he attracted people to himself, people, you will read uh, you, all the gospel, people uh, sometimes had to escape because people was running after him. So it's a completely different attitude. Um, uh, Jesus never talked about politics. 
was not a political leader. Uh, uh, at the, the end, when Jesus was condemned, people was asked to distinguish, to choose between Barabba and Jesus. Barabba was talking about the liberation from Roman occupation. Jesus was talking about salvation. So the horizon and the world and the attitude, Jesus is completely different from, uh, from what Herod's and uh, any human power. Um, and, and maybe to, to come toward the, the end of our um, webinar, what are, I would like to ask you maybe on a personal level, what are the, the price? I mean, um, social, economic price, personal price that, that for good leadership? Um, First of all, from the social point of view, uh, as I said at the beginning, you have to learn and accept to be alone. Second, uh, you don't have a normal social life. What better? You have only social life. Sometimes we don't have space for personal life. This is a price you have to pay. Uh, from the economical point of view, this is very important. Transparency. Everyone should know and, and completely understand what, what is your style of life, what you receive. Uh, complete, and what you see should be ethical, ac ethically accepted by the community. It cannot be too different. Uh, but once again, uh, this is always one of the points of, you are always exposed to criticism, of course. So to be prepared for criticism. Uh, Rabbi Karif, do you, do you feel the same? This, ten, this feeling of being a bit always socialized and also alone and uh, everyone needs to know everything about you and and have transparency in every aspect. Do you see that also as, as a part of, of the role of the leader in, in Judaism or in the Jewish communities that you lead? Yes, I think that, that um, and this, go, uh, this goes beyond the, the pandemic. I think that uh, general, generally we live in an era that the line between the private and the public slowly uh, disappears. And leaders and religious leaders uh, 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 among them um, are the first uh, victims of uh, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, new, new trend. And it definitely makes it even more uh, difficult to balance between our uh, uh, public duties and our private uh, uh, domain. And here I need to say that the need of a religious leader for a private domain is not only because we are all human beings and in the end, uh, uh, even uh, religious leaders have basic human rights, including privacy. I think we need to understand and the community need to understand that in order to secure the ability of the religious leader to serve the community, there must be some territories that we respect the religious leader as an individual. And one of the things that happened, and again, it's not only for religious leaders, I think it's, it's, it's uh, one of the challenges that we face today in the work, uh, in the general work market the lack of distinction between our houses and our workplaces. The fact that you can do today everything from your uh, uh, private uh, uh, house because of the Zoom technology. Uh, um, this, is a big, this is a big challenge. And, and the Patriarch uh, reminded us, and I want to say that while our progressive denominations enable themselves to uh, um, run all the communal services online, I, I, I want to thank the, the Patriarch in reminding us that in the end, you can't totally replace the human encounter and the physical encounter. And in the same way, you can't give up the need of religious leaders and, and other leaders also to have their uh, private domain. And, their current, and the current pandemic makes everything 
in that regard more complicated. To separate the life of the community and your, or your private life. It's different thing. Uh, also, uh, we are not married. <laughs> so we don't have a family. You, you give up the private family, life. In this case, the family helps you to keep you some aspect of your private life. For us, it's a little different sometimes. You don't have, uh, since you are not married, they think that all the time is for them. <laughs> well, I must correct. It's not it's correct. Not, you also need your private space, even yes. if you're in priest. Absolutely. I, must, Absolutely. Absolutely. I must share with the patriarch that after uh, uh, having my three kids uh, not in school for eight months, I'm thinking about adopting some of the Catholic uh, practices <laughs> in, in regard to our uh, religious leaders. <laughs> some of us are willing to sign today. On, uh... <laughs> well, new challenges bring new ideas. <laughs> yes. I think we raised many, many interesting issues this, uh, in the last uh, hour together. Um, first of all, I mean, the, the role of the leaders in this time of, in generally, um, is, is difficult, especially in these times where people are more individual, have more individual life and, and have more uh, uh, different ties and, and connection to different groups and, um, and to keep them together, especially during time of pandemic, when you don't really get together and you have to keep them together through Zoom or through all kind of virtual ways. Um, it's it's very challenging for religious leaders, and um, but at the same time, when uh, political leaders may be losing their trust, people looking for spirituality and actually looking for the religious leaders and looking for the religious uh, or spiritual answers uh, to their to their needs, and I think this is very interesting to 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 uh, indicate that. I think we talked a little bit about political leaders and religious leaders and. I find it very difficult to separate. I think the, the example of Hanukkah is a good example of how religion and politics are mixed and we see that a lot in the history. Um, while in the story of, of Jesus, there's a real try to separate politics, but when it comes to the role of the, of the Christian religious leaders, you cannot really separate politics and religion as, you could, as it could be in the scripture because we, we live our real life. And, and this challenge of ice solitude and being always socialized and keeping your private space and keeping your, your some borders between you and the community and finding um, the way where you, you have to be separated but, and when you, you're part of community. And this is also part, uh, part of the role of the leaders. Um, and, and the whole question of identity and belonging and having goals for the community and sharing your goals with the community and making sure that your goals are also the goals of the community and not, not going in the dictator way of, of King Herod and having your goals and forgetting the community behind you. Uh, so to go together, the religious community and the, um, and, and the leadership. And I think these are very interesting uh, points that you raised. And I, I really appreciate and thankful for, for your participation and, and for your time and Thank you for all the listener. And I want to wish um, all the Christians in the audience, and of course, your beatitude, very Merry Christmas. It's not going to be a regular Christmas. It's going to be very different. Uh, we also had very different Hanukkah this year with small gathering. And um, as we had the other holidays in the last year, and we can just hope and pray that uh, the coming year will be a better year. And uh, the next holidays, if it's Purim or... Passover and Easter will be celebrated with big crowd, with a lot of pilgrims and tourists. And uh, we're gonna be all healthy and in good health and, and safe uh, for the coming year. And I wish us all um, happy new year, a civil year. And uh, I hope that uh, yeah, we'll be able to, to communicate, to continue this uh, communication. Uh, between the religious leaders of the Holy Land who would be able to, to, to preserve diversity within the unity or unity within the diversity of the Holy Land. So thank you very much and have a nice Merry evening. Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas.